Good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. How glad I am today to welcome you into worship as we gather together to lift up the name of our great God. God is truly great and he is greatly to be praised. The psalmist says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. He is good and we come to worship our good and great God. So let us worship our God today in the beauty of holiness. Let's praise him. Let's give him thanks and glory for all that he has done for us and all that he continues to do. My brothers and sisters, let's worship our great God. The praise team, we just want to invite you in to lift up the name of Jesus. For indeed, this is the day that the Lord has made. For this is the day that the Lord has made. And it's the liberty of the Lord to rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah. 
Can we do that last part again? Dog. Oh. Our prayer for today, you bow your head. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we come before your throne of grace, Lord. We just come to give thanks and praise unto thee for another Sunday morning, O oh, gracious Father, that you have allowed us. We are so grateful for you being so kind and so merciful to all of us, O oh, Heavenly Father. We come today to lift up everyone under the sound of my voice, O oh, gracious Father, all of you who are tuned in today. Father God, we just ask your blessing upon all of us, O oh, gracious Father. We ask that you continue to bless us as we stand in the need of God. For we have, so many of us have different needs, O oh gracious Father. We just ask that you will give according to your will, O oh Heavenly Father. We ask a special blessing on the sick and shut in, O oh Heavenly Father, the ones who be, are not able to walk and are not able to even to take care of themselves, O oh gracious Father. We ask that you would just be what they need for you, O Heavenly Father, that you will strengthen them, O Gracious Father, in their hour of sickness, O Heavenly Father, that you will just be for them, O Gracious Father, the, the comforter that they need, O Gracious Father. Father God, we ask that you will bless the ones who have lost loved ones in this trying time, O Gracious Father. We ask that you will just strengthen them, O Gracious Father, lift them up, O Heavenly Father, put your arms around them, O Heavenly Father, and let them know that you are always by their side, O oh God, and Father, and to be just what they need you to be, God. Dear Lord, we just ask your blessing on all of us, O oh Heavenly Father, because we all stand in the need of blessing in some type of way, God. It's in your humble name that we do pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. There's no man willing in the name of Jesus. For at that great name, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that he is Lord. If you know he's great, can you just open your mouth and just wait and say, Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Oh. Oh. teacher of all, church, he said, You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Say it, everybody. You give 
thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Good afternoon. Uh, I've been given the task and privilege of preaching to us today the, the first word coming from Luke's gospel, the 23rd chapter, verses 34, to all of my fellow brethren. God bless you and keep you, and may the Lord's face shine upon you. Luke's gospel, as recorded by Luke, the 23rd chapter, verse 34, and it reads as such.
Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. I want to talk as briefly as the Lord would allow upon the subject they knew. They knew. How strange that this text is. It's strange because Jesus is asking forgiveness for people who are crucifying him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And I find it strange that he would ask for forgiveness for people who knew what they were doing. You can't tell me that the Romans who were mocking him and gambling over his garments didn't know what they were doing. You can't tell me that when they wrote in the inscription this is the king of the Jews, that they did not know what they were doing. In fact, they knew so much of what they were doing that the place that they were crucifying him is called the place of the skulls. Golgotha's heel. Can you imagine being at a place where the landfill is skulls? bones, these folk knew what they were doing. They knew how to ridicule him. They knew how to mock him. They knew how to scorn him. They tore his clothing from his body. They ridiculed him. They joked about him. They bit, beat him. They whipped him. They scourged him. They knew what they were doing. And yet Jesus says, Father, forgive them. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute now. Uh, 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 they were just merely doing their job. They, they had a job to do. It had been told to them that they had to crucify him. So they were just doing their jobs. And a lot of times, folk will make excuses for folk who are doing things in, in, the, in the mere fact of saying that they're just doing what they're supposed to be doing. There's no excuse. There is no excuse for the stuff they did to him. And yet they said, he said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. This was not a, a fact of forgiving. Uh, it was not a normal forgiveness the way you and I would forgive. This was not the type of forgiveness where someone will do us wrong and you know what, we just brush it off and say, let bygones be bygones. We, this was not the type of forgiveness where we make allowances for what people are doing to us. This was not that type of forgiveness where people will just smile their way through. Wish I had a witness here that could testify how many times they've had to smile their way through disastrous moments, to smile their way through folk who would ridicule them, mock them, and scorn them, and yet smile their way, acting like they really forgive, but really within their heart, they can't stand them jokers. You can't tell me they didn't know what they were doing. For in Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 6, they were plotting to kill Jesus. For the Pharisees and Sadducees had gotten together with Judas and had decided what they would do to him. You can't tell me they didn't know what they were doing. For in chapters 22, verse 52, the betrayal of Jesus happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he was betrayed with a kiss by Judas. You couldn't tell me they didn't know what they were doing. 
chapter 22, verse 66, Jesus is questioned by the Sanhedrin council, simply saying, if you are the Christ, say so. Instead of Jesus saying so, you, he says to them, you said it as such. They were ridiculing, mocking him. They knew what they were doing. Chapter 23, verse 4. Jesus is questioned by Pilate. And he's questioned so that in verse 10, the chief priests would urge the crowd on to say, listen, free Barabbas and give us Jesus to death. Pilate in verse 13 would wash his hands. So this puts us at a crazy oxymoron, if you will. Jesus is asking for forgiveness for folk who knew what they were doing. I want you to take note that Jesus was on the cross. Take note that he's getting ready to die. Take note, he knows what lies ahead of him. And Jesus, knowing he's 100% God and 100% man, says, Father, forgive them. I want you to take note of this. It doesn't say Jesus forgave. It says he asked for forgiveness of the folk who were mistreating him. My brothers and sisters, as hard as it may be, Jesus is on the cross and he's begging the pardon of somebody who put him there. As hard as it is, I know how you're feeling. I don't always want to beg the pardon of somebody who mistreated me. Don't always want to ask God to look at them and have mercy upon them. I don't always want to look for God to do the exceedingly abundantly for them. I want God to rain justice on them. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them. I want you to take note of that. That if you're going to be like Jesus, if you are going to live the life that he expects us to live, you've got to be able to look beyond your current circumstance and do what Jesus would do. And we have to stop using the excuse, I ain't there yet. Jesus says, Father, forgive them. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, because he understands these couple things, and I'm out of your hair. The first thing that Jesus understands is that the people that were crucifying him didn't know the call he had on his life. And my brothers and sisters, if the folk had known what Jesus, the call that was really on Jesus' life, then they would not have crucified him. But my brothers and sisters, you're being crucified. I'm being crucified, not because of who you are, but because of the call that God has on your life. And when God has a call on your life, folk just ain't going to like you. They're not going to get along with you. They're not going to love you. In fact, they're going to hate you. They're going to plot against you. They're going to scheme against you. They just won't like you, not because of who you are, but because of the call on your life. And I stopped by here to tell you today that while you're going through your struggles, going through your pain, you ought to just go ahead and lift up your hand in praise because even in spite of them not liking you, you've got a father that sits high and looks low on you. He loves you in spite of what they feel. He loves you in spite of what they're doing to you. God, our father, loves us. They didn't like him because of his calling. They didn't like him because of his power. And my brothers and sisters, whenever you're walking in the authority of God, he gives you favor, but you also have his power. 
You have power to do things that folk just can't imagine. You have the power to move mountains. You have the power with your faith to move beyond the circumstance in which you're living in simply because you've got not your power, but God's power on you. When you got the Lord's power, when you got the Lord's calling, then you know you got the hand of God resting upon you. Jesus knew what his calling and his plight was. He knew where he was headed to. He knew what was coming down the path. Jesus may not have had it in himself, in his human self, to pray for them, but he prayed anyhow. Sometimes forgiveness takes a long time. But you have the power to ask God's forgiveness. And if you think about it, you knew some of the things that you were going to do. If you think about it, you may not have plotted and schemed against Jesus, but you should have sinned against him. The moment you went lying, cheating, and stealing, you show sin against him. The moment you went back biting, talking about your fellow brother and sister, you show went and sinned against him. But I stopped by here to tell you that why? Because Jesus was on the cross. You don't have to worry about those things. All you have to do is seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near and repent of what you've done. And I can hear him saying to you, child, I've already asked your forgiveness. I don't know about you. I'm so glad that even though he knew what we were dealing with, we knew what we were doing. He asked our pardon. He begged and pleaded for us. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing God our father we thank you thank you for what our hearts are feeling right now thank you God for forgiving us for looking at us through the lens of a sin sick soul realizing that we couldn't forgive ourselves, but you forgave us. God, we thank you. We bless you. We pray now, God, that you would give us the heart to forgive others just as you forgave us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Thank God and amen.
second word of our Savior on the cross is directed to one of the thieves crucified yeah, yeah. with him. Yeah, yeah. The analysis of Jesus' second words on the cross set forth in Luke 23 to 42, it said, Then he said, Jesus, remember me yeah. when you come into your kingdom. Yeah. And uh, 43 is a response by Jesus to his request. He replied, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Yeah. So Jesus is crucified between two thieves. One of the thieves mocked Jesus, but the other thief rebuked him. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. One writer, one commentator put it this way in his works called In the Last Words of Saints and Sinners says, the last words of both saints and sinners about to enter eternity, what they had to say before their stammering tongue lay silent in the grave, demands our deepest attention and most earnest concern. Yes, if when the soul is faced with eternal reality, uh -huh. true character is almost invariably manifest. Yeah. Then we can expect the lips to express glorious certainty or terror concerning the future. Yes, All right. I want uh, to us to look at the last words of neither saint nor a sinner, but the last words of our sinless Savior, Jesus Christ. After Jesus was nailed on the cross, he spoke seven words, seven short phrases before he died. Luke 23, 43 is the second word of the seven words of Christ. The second word of our Savior on the cross is directed to one of the thieves crucified with him. An analysis of Jesus' second word on the cross as set forth in Luke 23, 43, teaches us about salvation. That's what it's about, about salvation. Salvation is what I'm talking about here. Salvation, about being born again, about being prepared to go to heaven. Salvation. Our salvation is directly connected to the cross of Jesus Christ. So we look at this word, salvation, in verse 43. Yeah. He says again, he replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Yeah. So what we see here is a request. Request in verse chapter 20, 23, 42. Yeah. First notice the request. The chief, the thief said to Jesus, Jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom. The dying thief asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom. Yes, the thief had been caught for a crime of theft and was being justly punished for his sin. At first, he, he was joined with the others because he was in the other crowd. He was in the crowd that mocked Jesus, that derided Jesus. But something happened in the heart of this man. The grace of God touched his heart. And who wouldn't be with the other group when it looked like all the circumstances were working against Jesus? It seemed as if the whole world was against him. So who wouldn't join in with the winning crowd? But he came to realize that it was not the winning crowd that he was celebrating with. Jesus, in his situation, in his individualism, Jesus, here in our text, he's the real winner that we'll discover later on in our message. But then, by the miracle of God's grace, this man's heart was changed. And he realized the man being crucified next to him was none other than the Lord of glory. He rebuked the other criminal, said to him, Listen, man, don't you fear God? 
since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly for we are getting what we deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Help me, Holy Ghost. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Uh, I was reading something just the other day, and, I, and, and the writer put it this way. His tragedy is, this man we're talking about in our text, this criminal, his tragedy is that he had an introduction to paradise so late. And his glory is that he found him just in time. His tragedy and his glory are not unlike you and mine. On Good Friday is the opportunity to redeem tragedy in the glory. For what is our tragedy but our failure to grasp what Christ can do for us in our lives here and now? And what is our glory? Get this, get this. But what is our glory but to discover with him how to live in heaven even while we live on earth? <laughs> we can live with God now. Right now on earth. This is a marvelous request. It is a request uttered in simplicity and humility. He recognizes that he was a sinner. But now he also recognizes that Jesus indeed is the true Savior. He asked Christ to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. Brothers, this is we 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 were like this dying thief. Mm. All of us were. Mm. Don't sit there looking so proud and distinguished. Right. Right. So wise and otherwise. With your usual self. You were a sinner. You were on your way to hell. With no God on your side. So come out that lofty mentality, that arrogance. When you think about what God has done for us, we were all there at one time, just where that thief was. The only difference in you and, and the thief and me and the thief is that we have trusted Jesus Christ. Oh, no about it. But then, by the miracle of grace, God came into our lives. He changed our heart, and we realized that the one who was crucified was none other than the Lord of glory. We cried out in words similar to the words of the dying thief. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Oh, oh, but to, re to have him remember us. When we think about what we were, what we were a few years ago. You ain't been in church all your life. I know you want people to think you've been here all your life. You've had a halo over your head all your life. You know, you have, you have, we're, we're all sinners. But we've been saved through the grace of God. I always, I've said, I've said a number, number of times, the church is a hospital uh, for sinners. It's really not a hospital. It's a hospital for sinners. But, we, but we, we're actually coming every Sunday uh, for recovery treatment. Everybody here, everybody, there's nothing that, there's nothing that distinguishes you from the alcoholic. I mean, I mean, the, the recovering alcoholic, our recovering drug addict, you know, the fact of the matter is that we're all recovering. You're recovering from something. So you come every Sunday for outpatient treatment. Okay. Every Sunday, don't get too, don't get too bourgeois, don't get too, don't get too much of a swag. God has been good. Notice, notice Jesus' response to uh, the request. Jesus, as I tell you the truth. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Yeah. Jesus promised the thief that he would be in paradise. Yeah. 
Now paradise simply means heaven, you know that. Yeah, yeah. Then the people who have been, who lived his life in sin and in rebellion against God, hello somebody, is now going to spend eternity in heaven because he has trusted yeah. in yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. More than just being in paradise. Yeah. Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me. Yeah. Yeah. He said, you'll be with me in paradise. Yeah. The promise is not only going to heaven. The promise is we'll be with him. You know what him I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. With him. <laughs>
pour conclure. Isn't it amazing that Jesus' words about salvation were spoken to a wretched criminal dying on the cross? One almost might have expected Jesus to say, Today you will be with me in paradise. To one of the apostles or some great saint somewhere. Yeah. But he didn't. His great promise of salvation was given to a wretched sinner. What a marvelous condescension on the part of Jesus here. The Lord of glory did not take a great saint with him into paradise. But this lowly crumb. Why? Because one writer said because he is a sample of all the rest. <laughs> it seems that if Jesus was saying to all of the angelic hosts, I'm escorting a sinner with me in the paradise. He's a sample of all the rest. <laughs> the great preacher Charles Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon had a special relationship with the original prophet of the church, the church where I am happen to have the privilege of being pastor. Charles Spurgeon knew Thomas Johnson, who was one of the first pastors of the original Providence Baptist Church, who was a preacher that came right out of slavery to become pastor of the original Providence Baptist Church. So he had a special, in the book written about their relationship, he ended up going to London to the pastor school started by Charles Spurgeon. All right. Hello, somebody. All right. But Charles Spurgeon said, it, it's, it's his kid uses the illustration of what we're talking about here. He said that a man dreamed he stood at the gates of heaven. Yeah. While standing there, he heard a band playing. Soon he saw a company of people entering the celestial court. Yeah. Who are these, he asked. These are the prophets, he was told. Alas, he said, I am not one of these. Wow. After a short while, he heard more music playing right. entering the celestial court. Right. Who are these, he asked. And these are the apostles. He told him, alas, he said, I cannot uh, enter with them. Later, he asked more music. He heard more music and the people entering the celestial court. Who are these, he asked. These are the martyrs, he told. Alas, he asked, he said, I am not one of these. Then he saw a great company of people coming to the celestial court. In the crowd of people, he saw Rahab, the prostitute. Mary Magdalene, Zacchaeus, and the thief who died at Jesus' side. Who are these? He asked. These are the sinners saved by grace. Told him then, uh, that very moment, said then he was very glad. He said, "I am uh, one of these."
give glory and honor to God our Father who has granted us this glorious privilege on this Good Friday to gather together once again in worship for our seven last words. Thank God for my brothers in the ministry who join us today as we partner together to see what the Lord has to say to us during this season. My task is to deliver the third word, a word of compassion. And you'll find that written in the Gospel of John, chapter 19. And I want to read verses 26 and 27. And there it reads, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. The Lord bless the reading of his word. A few moments today. I want to speak from this subject. He made a way. Yeah. He made a way. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Break us. Meld us. Mold us after thy will. Then use us your service. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This third word of Jesus from the cross of Calvary is a word of compassion. But the compassion expressed by Jesus is wrapped up in the activity of his provision that that because of the compassionate heart of Christ he provides for those that he saw standing at the cross because of a loving kind and tender heart he expresses to Mary and to John the wishes of his deepest emotion. He made a way. And I, I think that it's, it's appropriate for us to consider the fact that even today, with all that's going on in our lives, as we celebrate Good Friday. Yes, sir. We remember him on the cross. That he spoke a word of forgiveness. Yeah. To the very folk who were crucifying him on Calvary. Yeah. He made a way. Yeah. As he gave and uttered a word of salvation yeah. to a thief who was dying righteously and fairly for his own crimes, and yet God provided a seat in the kingdom of heaven for him, he made a way. There are three things I really want to leave with you real briefly. That if we consider the provisions of Jesus at the cross of Calvary, the first thing we ought to really take note of is we, we ought to examine and look at the selfless Christ. Watch Jesus on the cross. Take a good look at him hanging between two thieves. The blood running from his brow and from his hand, dripping off the thorns that are placed on his head, flowing down the, the, the post of the cross from the spikes in his feet, 
Look at Jesus suffering on our behalf. He was sinless. He had done no evil. He had committed no crime. They had a kangaroo court at midnight and put him on the cross. There in the midst of his suffering, in spite of the nails, in spite of the spikes, in spite of the crown of thorns around his head, the beatings and the railings of those who were around him, he was weary, wounded, bruised, worn, exhausted, dying on the cross, the Bible says. He looked at his mother and said, woman, behold thy son. Then he looked at the disciple whom he loved and said, behold thy mother. It's interesting to me, it's, it's, it's amazing to me that with all that Jesus was going through on Calvary, his first thought was for somebody else. Listen, that goes against human nature. That, that goes against you and I because, listen, when you and I are in our difficulties and in our struggles, the only thing we think about, me, myself, and I, we... We are, we are consumed by our own troubles and trials. Woe is me. But Jesus thought about his mother. And he thought about the disciple whom he loved. He, he understood that the crucifixion had to be tough on his mother. She had already undergone the slander of his birth. Yeah. Folk talking about her giving birth without being married and having cheated on Joseph uh, during that nuptial year. It had to be hard on her. She, she bore him not in a hospital and, and not in a, a warm bed, but she bore him in a sting. Yeah. Wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. It had to be hard her. Saw him grow up 33 years and now to see him hanging on the cross for our sins. Jesus thought about her. He, he, he knew that there was an ache in her heart and he addressed her need in spite of his own suffering. Is there anybody here today that's glad that the Lord thinks about us? Amen. You know, you know, if it had some of us in when we get in positions of power and authority, you, you, you just do it because I can I tell you to do it. Amen. And I don't worry about what the fallout's gonna be for those of under us. Amen. But but just give me what I need to, to satisfy me for the moment. But he looked at our need. Somebody said he looked beyond my fault and saw my need. He's a selfless Christ. In spite of the fact that he was hurting, he looked out for his mother. In, in spite of the fact that folk talked about him, he looked out for his friend. In spite of the fact that they were gambling over his clothes, his thought was for somebody else. Let's not get too long. Let me suggest secondly that not only are we examine the selfless Christ, but, but we ought to take a look at the selected crowd. Because the Bible says he looked at his mother and then he looked at the disciple whom he loved. There were a whole bunch of folk around the cross. There were Roman centurions. There were two thieves hanging on either side. There were folk there who were just spectators. There were the, the folk uh, that our late pastor used to say we were nothing but the sinners and watchers. <laughs> uh, just want to see what's going on and, and who's getting killed today. Uh, but, but he singled out of all of the folk around the cross, his mother, and Joseph. 
young, his mother, he said, Mother, behold your son. Listen, I really wish I had a Bible really here today. We really have gone through this. You, if you really study the, uh, uh, the, the relationship between Jesus and Mary, yeah. you, you'll come to the conclusion that it wasn't like the Catholics say, the, the mother of God and all the whole. Listen, there was some tension between Jesus and Mary uh, all of his life. Come on in here. I need you to help me. You remember when he was 13? When he was 12 years old, he went there to the synagogue and, and, and they were there for the celebration. They left town and left Jesus there and they went back and found him three days later and said, what's wrong with you? You had us worried about you. Why are you here? He looked at his mother and said, don't you know? Why are you asking me? Don't you know? That I must be about my father's business. She's trying to hold him back. And he said, I must be about my father's business. And there's that, there's that strange episode with the wedding. Cana of Galilee. Amen. When, when, when they were both at the party. And, and the good wine and the cheap wine ran out. And, and she comes to Jesus and she says, listen, they ain't got no wine. You know, this is a party. Somebody's going to be in trouble. If, 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 you know, it's going to be an embarrassment to the family if the wine runs out. He says, what has that got to do with me? It is not yet my time. And so when he was trying to hold back, she's trying to push him ahead. She goes to the attendant and says, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. Tension between them. And then there's that, that opportunity, that moment when, when he was surrounded by the scribes and the Pharisees. They wanted to kill him. Yeah. And his mother and his brothers and sisters came around and, and they went running to him and said, Jesus, your mother and, and, and your brothers are out there. You're, you're, and he says to them, who is my mother? Who are my brothers and my sisters? Only those who do the will of God. Tension between them. But in spite of the tension, Jesus looks at her and says, Mother, behold your son. Then he looks at Jesus. I'm rather at John. And, 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 and I like the way the text reads, before he calls him by name, he says, the disciple whom he loved. Amen. Amen. The disciple whom Jesus loved. Look, notice that, that, that he did not choose John to take care of Mary simply because he was the least, last, and left common denominator. That's right. Because all the other ones had gone. He, he did not pick John simply because he was the only one left to take care of him. Uh, because, you know, he, he, Mary could have said, listen, I've got some other children. Uh, I, I've got Judas and I've got some others who will take care of me. James is next in line. That's really by, by, by law, he ought to take care of me. I don't need anybody else, but, but he chose John. He didn't choose him because he was the last one. He didn't, he didn't choose him because he, he, he was in the family. But he chose him because he loved him. John could have said, listen, I, I got a business to run. I'm, I'm half only in, J in Zebedee and Sons Fishing Emporium. <laughs> but he picked him up. He chose him because he loved him. Yes. Isn't it good to know, my brothers and sisters, that you've been chosen today? Not because of your status. Not because you've been so good. Not because you've done everything God wanted you to do. You dotted every I, crossed every T. But simply you've been chosen because He loves you. Yeah. Let me get out of here. Tell you that, that, that not only are you paying attention to the selfless Christ. 
Not only should you examine the selected crowd, but finally you ought to look, take a real close look at the submitted choice. Because the Bible says, that second, that 27th verse says, uh, from that day forward, he took her into his own house. Yeah, both, both John and Mary had to be willing to do what Jesus said. Mary could have gone on with her other children. She could have, she could have in grief just decided that she didn't want to live with anybody. Matter of fact, she could have said, I don't want to live anymore. You, you let the feast go to paradise, let me go with it. But yet she was willing to submit to, to Jesus even when he was hanging on the cross. Don't you know that, that most of us have a hard time submitting to Christ and he's already gotten up. But here he is at his darkest hour, hanging between two thieves, about to give his life for all the sins of the world. And yet uh, Mary and John were willing to do what he said to do. He really said, I'm making provision for you. I love you. And because I love you, mother, I want you to go with John.
all the people said, Amen. Praise the Lord for this opportunity to be able to be present in this manner. I thank God for my brethren, and I thank God for this privilege to be a sandwich between Brother Funches, Brother Rowan, my pastor Love, uh, Brother Powell, Reverend Hamilton, and Reverend Jones. God bless these, my, my pastor brothers. Love you. Praise the Lord. A privilege to stand with you. Praise the Lord. My assignment is the fourth word taken from Matthew 27, 45 and 46. This passage also appears in Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through 34. I would like to read the passage from Matthew in your hearing at this time. Matthew 27, verse 45 reads, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I want you to pray with me for this moment as we talk about a message entitled, Cover for Cover. Once again, cover for cover. Praise the Lord. It was reaching the end of a period of darkness on the cross. Darkness that spanned, as the texts say, from the sixth to the ninth hour. That's from noon to 3 p.m. our time. And brothers and sisters, we're talking about a darkness that our Lord and Savior had known before. He was there in the beginning. He created the heavens and the earth. He, he created the light and uh, separated the day from the night. But brothers and sisters, this darkness that was on Calvary was not the darkness that, or the night that he created in the beginning. This was a darkness that he didn't create. And brothers and sisters, I know some have speculated that, there, that it could have been a solar eclipse, but brothers and sisters, I don't believe it was even that kind of darkness. It was another kind of darkness. It was the worst kind of darkness on Calvary from noon to 3 p.m. And as we are reaching the end of this period of darkness, our Lord and Savior utters these words. Brothers and sisters, he had endured a tremendous amount of pain. But I submit to you the physical pain of being beaten, the physical pain of nails in the hands, the physical pain of nails in the feet, and all of your weight on the cross being supported by the pain of those nails through your limbs. I submit to you that his greatest pain, even though it was great, was not physical. I submit to you that his greatest pain was of a different nature. Brothers and sisters, it was typical for those on the cross having their hands nailed on a horizontal member and having a nail in their feet. It was typical for those dying on the cross with your hands nailed on both sides that your diaphragm, your, your diaphragm muscle will cut off your ability to pull in air in the lungs. And so my understanding is that most of those who were crucified on crosses back in that time died from asphyxiation. 
due to the ability, the inability to pull in air in the lungs because of that diaphragm muscle, uh, sort of in a way being hamstrung by the hands being nailed to the cross. But brothers and sisters, you might note that at the end of this period of darkness, the text said, he cried with a loud voice. Hello, somebody. The text said it was a loud voice. And so for a person who typically is suffering from asphyxiation, and the text saying this is a loud voice, tells you and me, brothers and sisters, that our Lord and Savior did what he had to do, stood up on those nails, inhaled a big breath of air, and cried out with a loud cry. Hello, somebody. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Brothers and sisters, I submit to you that at this point, he was experiencing his greatest pain. Yeah, brothers and sisters, he wasn't, there were folks gathered around the cross, but I submit to you, he wasn't talking to man one of them gathered around the cross. Brothers and sisters, he was talking to his father and he was speaking in Aramaic, speaking to his father, which is interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Brothers and sisters, this is the first time he addressed the father as my God, not father, like he did in the Garden of Eden, or I'm sorry, the Garden of Gethsemane, but my God, my God. And one commentator said he was addressing the father as his judge. Brothers and sisters, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I submit to you that his greatest pain was not physical pain. His greatest pain was spiritual and emotional pain. Are you feeling what he felt, brothers and sisters? Brothers and sisters, for the first time in all of the eternity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, y'all know that he's always been here. He's here right now and he always will be. And there had never, ever in all of eternity, for time gone by, never had there been a time of separation between the Father and the Son. I submit to you, brothers and sisters, it wasn't physical pain that made him stand up on those nails. It was emotional, spiritual pain from being separated, from being abandoned from the Father. For the first time in the cosmos, the Father was separated from the Son. And I submit to you, that's what hurt him the most. Brothers and sisters, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, He who knew no sin, he was made sin for us that we might become the righteousness for God. So brothers and sisters, when, when that darkness was laid on him, brothers and sisters, it activated the holiness of the Father. And at that point, the Father began to back up from the Son because he couldn't see his Son no more. He saw your sins and my sins laid on him. Oh my goodness, hallelujah. Everything we ever did wrong was laid on him and it activated the holiness of the Father and he backed up from the Son. And I believe that's what hurt Jesus the most. Hello somebody. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And get this, you all, Jesus is all God. That means that he's omniscient. He knows everything. But the text now lets us know that he who knew everything 
didn't know anything about what was laid on him. In other words, let me fix it this way. For the first time in the existence of Jesus, he became the pupil and we were the teacher. When all of our sins were laid on him that he had never known before in his omniscience, he became the pupil and attended the university of sin where you and I were the professors. Hello, somebody. He was the pupil for that that he had never known before. Your sins, my sins, lying, cheating, stealing, all of our sins were laid on him that he never knew before. Hallelujah, y'all. Jesus took on what he never knew before. Can you imagine how that felt for a sinless, holy God to become sin when our sins were laid on him as a sin offering that you and I might be set free. So you all, this is the first covering. This is Jesus being covered with your sins and my sins. Jesus becoming, uh, being that sin offering, covered with that he had never known before. And I just want to just bring up this little point here where the text just sort of gets my attention. Jesus said, he said, my God, my God, here comes the question. Why hast thou forsaken me? And there was no answer. Brothers and sisters, the point here is that sin will always leave the sinner with the question of why. Why am I separated from God? Why did I do this? Why was I not thinking right? Why did I perpetrate? And brothers and sisters, sin will always leave us with that unanswered question. Brothers and sisters, I'm so glad that Jesus went there first. I'm so glad that he took on our sins. And when the question was asked, why? Oh, brothers and sisters, when you get to know Jesus Christ as your love and Savior, your Lord and Savior, his love speaks to you and me. Brothers and sisters, Jesus took on our sins that you and I, when we accept him as Lord and Savior, he was covered with our sins. That's the first cover. That when you and I confess him as our Lord and Savior, just as the Father saw our sins laid on him and backed up from the Son, when the Father, when we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and the Father looks at you and me, you know what he doesn't see anymore? He doesn't see our sins. He doesn't see your sin and my sin. But he cast them, and once again, an omniscient God, cast our sins into the sea of forgetfulness, cuts out a section of his omniscience, hello somebody, and throws it away never to know it again because of the shed blood of his son. So brothers and sisters, when he looked at Jesus, during this hour, from the sixth to the ninth hour, he saw our sins laid on him. But when we confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior, because of that shed blood, when the Father now looks at you and me, he doesn't see our sinful nature, but he sees us covered with the blood of his Son. Hallelujah! And instead of him backing up from us, he draws near to us. Hallelujah! For the covering of the blood and the indwelling. That means he moves inside of my sin sick soul. And he indwells in me because of the blood of Jesus. And brothers and sisters, there's going to come a time when you and I will walk physically alone. But if you know Jesus, 
You are never alone. Hallelujah. Because he's always with us. He's with us in the midnight hour. And for those of us married, that sometimes you're sleeping in the same bed, but if you're having one of those bad dreams, the Lord even be with you in your dream. He'll turn a nightmare into breakthrough because he's always with us. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I'm his own. And the joy we share as he tarried there, none other has ever known. Brothers and sisters, covered for God. He was covered with our sin that we might be covered with his blood. And Revelation 21, 7 says, he that overcome, God says, I will be his God and he will be my son. That means, brothers and sisters, just as he backed up from Christ because our sins were laid on him, brothers and sisters, when the reconciliation, when it's all done, when we overcome and we're in the kingdom of Christ, he says, God, the Father says, we will be his son. So we will all be incorporated as the body of Christ into the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And we're part of the body of Christ. We're going to all be incorporated into that Trinity. Hello, because of the shed blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 God bless you. God keep you. Praise the Lord. Amen. I am grateful for the things that you have done. Yes, I'm grateful for the victories we won. I could go on and on and on about your words. Grateful just to praise you, Lord. Flowing from my heart are the issues of my heart is gratefulness. have done. Yes, I'm grateful for the victories we won. I could go on and on and on about your words because I'm grateful, grateful, so great for just to praise you, Lord. Flowing from my heart are the issues of my heart is gratefulness. Grateful, 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 gratefulness. It's flowing from my heart. Grateful, 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 
to this preaching moment. Pray that you would give us strength. God, not my will, but thy will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. As we continue with the fifth word, the word of anguish, found in John 19, verse 28. If you read, you'll find these words. It says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. I want to talk for a little while from the thought, a glimpse of the experience. This fifth word, the word of anguish, is honestly just a glimpse of what Jesus really experienced. Anguish, by definition, is a severe or mental pain physical or mental, I should say, uh, a suffering and an experience an extreme distress. Words that are synonymous with anguish include agony. It, it includes pain and torment. It includes suffering and distress, angst, misery, Sorrow, grief, torture, heartache, heartbreak, unhappiness, despair, darkness, and hell. Yes, Jesus experienced hell so that we did not have to. And so as we look at, at this anguish, it, it often is, is difficult to, to deal with anguish even when you have caused the anguish on yourself. When you have done things uh, personally, when you have caused this, this issue to happen, but Jesus was not in that place because he had done nothing to cause this anguish that he was facing. And so as we look at, at, at our text and as we think about this fifth word, the, the thing that comes to mind, and I, I want to share with us quickly that we must understand if we are really going to have a glimpse of the experience, we must understand why Jesus said, I thirst. He said, I thirst, first of all, because he did not want his people to, to go through the challenges and the difficulties that they were facing anymore. He, he wanted to put an a end to, to the struggle and to the challenges of trying to live a life full of sin. But not only did he want us to, to, to not uh, go through anymore, but, but secondly, he says, I thirst because he was putting in the work 
so that we did not have to uh, put in the work. We did not have to do it because he knew that we were not adequate to do what it is that was needed. So Jesus says, I thirst because I don't want my people to go through this anymore. Jesus said, I thirst because he was putting in the work so we did not have to. But thirdly, he says, I thirst because he was experiencing something that he had never uh, experienced before. In other words, Jesus was out of his element. He was outside of the place where he was used to being. So, so reflect with me, if you will, uh, as, as Jesus delivers mankind to a place that, that, that had everything that they needed and instead made God's will, God's will and got completely off of the path and and now is in need of rescuing now is need of saving now is need of being brought out of his situation too many times we pretend as if we really understand what it is that Jesus went through. We, we pretend as if we understand what it was really like. But, but when we think about him saying, at first, we really are only getting a glimpse of what Jesus experienced. A peek. A small look at what Jesus went through. Jesus takes on your sin. He takes on my sin. He takes on generations before us and generations after us. He, he takes on the sin of those that, that look like us and those that don't look like us. Some that have done more stuff than we have. And then some who have not done, have not sinned as much as we have. For those who have no money. Those who have little money. Those who have much money. For those who are educated and those who are uneducated. Jesus allows us to get a glimpse. But most importantly, he wants us to accept what he has done. He says, I thirst. Why? Because he has experienced pain for you. He's experienced grief for, for you. In, in other words, Jesus has a thirst that is brought on, which is an indication that he has given all that he has to save a wretch like me. Can I tell you today that the truth of the matter is we have drained Jesus dry. We have taken all of he that he had in him in order to save us, in order to put us in the place that he needed us to be. I don't know if anybody has ever been in an experience where you've really been thirsty, where you've given all, where you've expended everything that you have, and you don't really know you. You're parched, if you will, and you can't even taste anything that resembles liquid and water. Jesus is saying, I gave it all. On behalf of my people, I gave it all for my people. And, and today he just wants us to get a glimpse of what he's done. Because when you start to get a glimpse of what he's done, it reminds you of how good our God is. How much he's done for us and how all of us can be blessed by the work that he's done. Aren't you glad to know today that yes, he put in a whole lot of work, but he did it for you. He did it for your brother. He did it for your sister. He did it for all of us. 
We're saved today because we have a glimpse of what Jesus has done. He says, I thirst. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm thirsty. He says, I, I, I need a refilling because I've emptied out everything that I have in order that I may save mankind. God bless you today. This fifth word, the word of anguish is a glimpse of what Jesus went through to save sinners like us. Let's pray. God, thank you now for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for how you given it all. How you totally expended yourself on our behalf. And God, we love you for it. You shed your blood for us. And we are grateful today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.
Testament flow. Our word is the fifth word, John chapter 19, verse 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Consecrate us now to thy service, Lord, by the power of your grace and divine, allow our souls to look up with a steadfast hope, and our will is simply lost in thine. Let us say a word that you might be glorified and we might be edified. It is finished. A comprehensive, yet comfortable word. A dying declaration with a dynamic exclamation. It is finished. Jesus' final word, tetelestai, in the ancient Greek, was the cry of a winner. Jesus had finished the eternal purpose of the cross. It stands today as a finished work, the foundation of all Christian peace and faith, paying in full the debt we righteously owe to God and making peace between God and man. A single word can change everything. Not guilty in a court of law changes everything. Fair on the playing field changes everything. When a woman says yes to a marriage proposal, it changes everything. Goodbye can change everything. Yet there has never been a single word said that has impacted history like this word Jesus says in John 19 and 30. At some point before he died, the veil was torn in two. Before he cried out, it is finished. An awesome spiritual transaction took place. God the Father laid upon God the Son all the guilt and wrath our sin deserved. And he bore it in himself perfectly, totally satisfying the wrath of God. I mean, even the devil will really celebrate you starting a thing because he knows he can put enough drama in your way that he'll discredit your testimony. Thank you, Jesus because you will surrender the very blessing that you were going toward. But somebody can declare today, I can finish what I started because Jesus finished. Well, what was finished? Well, the prophecies concerning his death. Isaiah 53 and 3 says he was despised and rejected of men. He was betrayed by a friend forsaken by his disciples. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. His hands and feet felt the spikes and the nails. He was numbered with his transgressors. Jesus came to do just what he's doing now. He was born to die. It is finished. It is really the culmination of all that he said from the cross. From the time of his birth, until he's nailed to the cross. Jesus stays focused on his purpose. His desire was to complete his assignment just like he started. He had a miraculous birth. Holy Spirit overshadowed a virgin by the name of Mary. Now he dies a substitutionary death for mankind and the earth is overshadowed by darkness, the darkness of sin. It is finished. The ceremonial law is abolished. No more pigeons or turtle doves. God no longer wants rituals. He desires a relationship. It is finished. His pain and suffering is now finished. The malice and enmity of his persecutors are at their worst. But Jesus 
in spite of all he's gone through, is still at his best. He said, I thirst. And instead of giving him a cool drink of water, they gave him vinegar and wine. After this last indignity, he says, it is finished. In other words, I'm about to move out of their reach. He seems to suggest I'm going to where the wicked shall cease from trouble, where the weary will be at rest, where the saints of all ages will shout hallelujah and be blessed. As he prayed in the garden called Gethsemane, he said, my soul is sorrowful even unto death. Father, if it can be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but your will be done. Now, it is finished. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Every sin from the beginning of time was in that cup. Adam's sin was in the cup. Eve's sin was in the cup. Cain killed Abel was in the cup. Sodom and Gomorrah was in the cup. Lot's incest with his daughters was in the cup. Mm. Samson and Delilah were in the cup. Noah getting drunk was in the cup. All the sins were in the cup. But not only those sins, the lie you told last year was in the cup. The dirty deed that somebody did even as late as yesterday, was in the cup. Yeah. Things that happened 20 years ago were in the cup. The person that you cussed out was in the cup. Everything you and I did was in the cup. Yeah. That's why the cup was so bitter. I know you look holy now, and I'm glad he moved from contemplation to nevertheless. Oh. Acts 2 and 23 says, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God, ye have taken by wicked hands, have crucified and slain. It is finished. God himself had forsaken Jesus, but now even that relationship is finished. Finally, the price for sin is now paid in full. The Greek word Telco, also translated, paid, accomplished, performed. In other words, full satisfaction is made to the justice of God. A fatal blow given to the power of Satan. A fountain of grace is now open that shall ever flow. It is finished. We were redeemed by the blood. He came to take away your sins and mine. Through his death and resurrection, the devil is defeated. But there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and set us plunge beneath the blood, lose all their guilt and stain. It is finished. I'm almost finished. But when he finished, my redemption is satisfied. My faith is justified. My life is sanctified. My joy is multiplied. My hope is purified. You and I are edified. My way home is simplified. Simply because it is finished.
on today we want to take an opportunity to share a, a word with you to those who are present, to those of you who are with us, with us on today. Our passage of scripture for today, for those of you who are able to stand, please look at chapter 23, verse 46. Luke 23, verse 46. Luke chapter 23, verse 46. And the letters of the international version it sounds like this. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Amen. God bless you. Let me see the word of God for the people of God. Right. A few moments, I want you to think about this passage. This is this thought that I want you to think about. Jesus has the power to die. Jesus has the power to die. Now see there, I know what you're thinking already. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, you know, you know, don't everybody have that power? No. Because we can't die when we want to. As a matter of fact, these figures, I don't even know if we want to die. Uh, what's that phrase? Is everybody wants to go to heaven. Yeah, you got it. I thought you had it. I thought you had it. Listen, as we are in the season of Lent, as well as our 40 days of restoration. Matter of fact, we're in the 12th day of that today. Yes, sir. We lean toward, as well as preach toward, the celebration that defines our reality as Christians. Oh, yeah. That being resurrection, resurrection Sunday, uh -huh. a.k.a. Easter. Oh, right. now, now, while I'm a reasonably educated man, Meaning that I know that the usage and meaning of the term or the word Easter actually began as a non-religious festival celebrating the coming of spring. But not only that, many, many folks just learned that in the last 30 years, especially black folk. They should not be afraid to refer to Resurrection Sunday as Easter. You see, brothers and sisters, it's not like you're going to go to hell if you use the word Easter uh, to reference the day celebrated as the day of reference to the resurrection of our Christ. Now, having said that, today I want us to visit the experiences, the feelings, the ministry, and the power of Christ, which can be shared any day of the year. You know, I remember when I was when I was uh, when I was a younger child, and I sang in what they called then the youth choir. And we had a song that our director taught us, and uh, the song was talking about. It has mentioned. Uh, I, I wish I could think, think, think of it. I can't really think of it completely. But the song had a lot to do with the coming of Jesus. And, uh, and as we sang that little song with our little selves, I can remember there was a lady in the audience. Uh, yeah, matter of fact, this was doing a private rehearsal. She was sitting in the audience, and uh, she stood up and she says, Why are you all singing that Christmas song in July? Yeah. And you know, when, you know, I'm saying to myself, I wasn't old enough, Sister Phyllis, to say what I say now that I'm grown. But I would have I said to her at that particular time, it's not a Christmas song, it's a Jesus song. And you ought to be able to sing about Jesus any season of the year, any time of the year. You ought to be talking, you ought to be able to talk about Jesus any time of the year. I mean, we ought not just talk about Jesus when it gets close to Easter, or when it gets close to Christmas. You know, we, we, we ought to talk about Jesus and the whole story. Anytime. Now, now, having said that, as we visit these experiences, which are moments of our faith, today, for a few moments, I want us to take a look at what happened, what was spoken, what was given, and what was experienced, as well as what comes from the cross. 
as Jesus hangs from the cross. You know, you, we don't talk about Jesus hanging from the cross until the week before Easter. And, and, and I shudder to think that sometimes that may cause us to not think about Jesus until the week before Easter. I want to take this opportunity right now to uh, make mention of the fact that we are uh, 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 grateful to have uh, Brother Hooker and Pastor Hooker here with us for today. God bless you. Now, notice this, brothers and sisters, as Christ hangs on the cross, there is forgiveness coming from the cross. Because Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. As Jesus hangs on the cross, there is salvation coming from the cross. Because Jesus answered and said to the thief, to one of them anyway on the cross, he said, Today I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. As Jesus hangs on the cross, there is compassion coming from the cross. For when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, behold your son. While Jesus was hanging on the cross, there is the reality of being forsaken experienced from the cross. Because the Bible says it's three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Rama Sabbatana. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. While Jesus was hanging on the cross, there is an overwhelming feeling of anguish experience. Because the Bible says that later, knowing that everything had now been finished, yeah. so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just talking about what happened about you. Yeah. 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 I don't mean to put you out of sleep. There is the fulfillment of accomplishment radiating from the cross because when Jesus received the drink, the Bible says, he said, it is finished. Now, with that being said, Christ now does something with his words and his actions that only God the Father could let him do. That being to die on his own terms. Yes. At his own time. Yes. You see, the death of Christ was not euthanasia. You see, this was not Christ dying in his sleep. Jesus died on his own terms. Jesus died in his own time. I want you to hear what I'm saying today. Listen, listen, listen. Check this out. As human beings, God gives us life on this earth. And we spend the rest of our lives trying to keep the life that God has given us above the ground. Or out of the mausoleum. Or out of the urn. I want you to hear what I'm saying today. However, Jesus on the other hand was given life on this earth, being born of a virgin. He lived his life on the earth with the intention and the commitment to die. So that those of you hearing this message of the gospel will believe in their heart of the Lord Jesus and confess with their mouth that God is raised from the dead and might be saved. And that the rest of the world might have salvation opportunity. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Think about this for a minute. At any time, Jesus could have stopped down and brought himself down from the cross. As a matter of fact, I, I need Dr. Felker here with this because Dr. Felker will remember this being said back in the day. When the thief spoke to Jesus on the cross, the preacher used to say, and Jesus stopped dying for a minute. <laughs> Two or three of y'all old enough to remember hearing that. And he turned to him and said, today, you would be with me in prayer. And well, he could have got down if he wanted to, but he didn't. He showed that he has the power to die.
by saying it is finished. He showed us that he has a power to die. Now, for you see, all those things would have been meaningless if Christ had not shown humanity that he has the power to die. There was even a time when Jesus said, no man take my life. I give it. I wonder if you hear what I'm saying today. Listen, listen, you used to say this, probably still do. Listen, he would not come down from the cross just to save himself. What he decided to die. So think about this, brothers and sisters, while you were thanking Jesus for so many wonderful things, why are you thanking him for waking you up this morning? Why are you thanking him for the activities of your limbs? Why are you thanking him for the correctness or the rightness of your mind? Why are you thanking him for the roof over your head and the automobile that you have and the job that you have and the money in your pocket? And why, why are you thanking him for all that stuff? I don't want to have to 
walk past Maurice. I don't want to have to speak to Maurice. I don't even want Maurice looking at me. But try explaining that to the Lord. I want you to hear what I'm saying today. But because of God's love, God looks beyond all of that. And he's still loves.
So 
Lord, I shine. 